Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Lisa Tamaris Becker, director of the CU Art Museum of the University of Colorado at Boulder. Founded over 70 years ago, the CU Art Museum explores the transformative power of art and inspires critical dialogue throughout the university and the community. The museum's permanent collection was started in 1939 and currently contains over 6,000 works of art. Lisa Tamaris Becker previously served as interim director and curator of the Richard L. Nelson Gallery and Fine Arts Collection at UC Davis, the curator of exhibitions and the administrative head of the exhibitions department of the John Michael Kohler Arts Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and associate director of women and their works in Austin, Texas. She's generously agreed to share some of her insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. Thank you, it's a great pleasure to be here. You have been at the CU Art Museum for several years now, and you're in a great position to talk about the unique place that university museums have in the constellation of, uh, of museums, as contrasted, for example, with independent museums, municipal museums, and such. Could you talk a bit about how the CU Art Museum functions within the constellation in which it sits in, at the university? Sure. I have been at the CU Boulder Art Museum for eight and a half years, and we just built a new 25,000 square foot museum. And we're at the literally the center of campus. We're right next to the student center and directly across from the main public parking, a kind of entry to the campus. And so we're very near where the community comes to the campus, but where the center of student activity is as well. And that fits with our multi-pronged mission. I say first and foremost, we're connected to the teaching and research mission of the university. So serving as a laboratory-like learning environment. Um, we have active visitation by classes to the museum's permanent collection galleries, changing exhibitions, and also to our collection study center, which is a really important part of our teaching and research mission. And then we perceive our relationship with the community, too, as uh, serving learners of all ages. So adult community learners, uh, K through 12, and students, first and foremost. But all those community visitors come to a university wanting to continue their education. So that's how we approach our relationship. So it becomes a doorway into the university. Yes. We've called the museum a gateway, a cultural gateway to the campus and it actually physically also is a gateway. We built the museum um, next to the Department of Art and Art History. They're separate uh, administratively, but sit side by side. And there's a walk between the two buildings called the Art Walk. It has a very large uh, work of public art on it, and so it is literally also a gateway. So the, the museum's at the center of the campus, and so it becomes sort of the natural uh, connecting point right. the, as, as the public right. comes in. Right. In terms, of, in terms of how the museum functions, how do you work with faculty as contrasted with your general public or, or as contrasted with your students? I would say that we are one of the most vigorous teaching and research focused university art museums in the country right now. There are certainly others like the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College. Um, we have many faculty serving as guest curators or co-curators, for example. So thinking of the campus as a kind of collective intelligence and wanting to work with the immense creativity of ideas and the, and the knowledge across disciplines ranging from Asian studies, African studies, uh, Latin American studies, you know, as well as art history, um, to realize really unusual projects. A good example would be um, an exhibition I co-curated of contemporary Tibetan art together with an anthropologist from the campus who had deep connections with the Tibetan community. And what was unique about this exhibition is it had artists living and working in Tibet together with those living and working in exile communities, London, mm -hmm. the U.S., so Switzerland. So it's part of the, the Tibetan diaspora. Right. But what made it uh, groundbreaking was the contemporary artists that also still live and work in Tibet today and bringing those two together. And again, that's the kind of project could not have happened without that connection to the faculty, to the strength in anthropology with the focus on Tibet that we have at our university. So does this mean that, that the essential relationship, the curatorial relationships are not necessarily with the art history department, but are with the university as a whole? 
Yes, because we are a campus-wide resource, and um, our funding reflects that. We receive as a base for our programming funds um, dollars from a, a student arts and cultural enrichment fee that's assessed on all students. Oh, so the students are also contributing. Yes, to, to yes. And we also received the two buildings were built side by side, but as one uh, budget, and we received thirty million dollars from students of all majors. So we see our mission as to serve all students of all majors and faculty and research across the entire university campus. So a campus-wide resource. Certainly, there is also a special relationship with art and art history, which is. Um, one department, but with two significant areas. So that's the studio arts area and the and the art historical area. Right, and so we have had uh, art art history faculty guest curate. We've also had an art history faculty member work with her class mm -hmm. to curate an exhibition, and so that's not to say we don't generate our own exhibitions as well that we curate entirely in house. But we look to do a lot of co curating and collaborative work with the university. So your terminal degree is in studio arts as opposed to uh, uh, having a PhD in art history. Could you describe how that uh, sensibility that comes from that background informs your approach as a director today? Yes. So I believe very strongly in the intellectual role of the artist, which historically was very strong. I mean, there was a day when the majority of the significant curators at the Museum of Modern Art, for example, had MFAs. Uh, the photography curator had an MFA in photography. So I chose a graduate school uh, where I could pursue dual modalities of training, studio art, theory, art history, and I was also interested in architectural history. But that passion and connection that I have to studio practice and with my particular specialization curatorially in modern and contemporary art, I think it's been really valuable and creates a deep, deep connection to artists and the way I build an exhibition, the aesthetics of the exhibition. So there's the intellectual construct of the exhibition and there's the physical and visual construct of the exhibition, both of which in the end are incredibly important to its realization. And so my particular training, I think, gives me a particular sensitivity to the visual aesthetics as well as to how the artist's mind works and the relationship I have with artists. Now, does that extend beyond the contemporary into the art um, that has led to the contemporary? Yes, I have directed exhibitions across all time periods. So I also directed the opening of the first permanent collection galleries for the new CU Art Museum. So that would be ancient classical material, including Roman glass, Roman coins, Greek pottery, uh, Southeast Asian pottery, ancient Iranian, medieval, Renaissance and Baroque, American painting. Again, I get comment after comment about how beautiful the galleries look, and I'm very involved as the director there in how that comes to be working with the team, but leading it for an aesthetic realization of the gallery. So I would say that's, that directly relates to the, all the experience I had in my MFA work, doing installation work. It's actually very parallel. So I, I have worked and, and championed artists of many backgrounds, men and women. But I am deeply concerned that um, collections are a kind of archive and representation of history. And so I have taken many of the inspirations that were important to me as an artist and carried those forward in my work as a curator and director. It is a truism in the field that there are uh, far fewer um, female directors than there are qualified women in the field. Often one even sees that the art that has been produced historically um, by women um, has been, um, in certain respects, historically marginalized, um, while uh, art that has been produced by men has, has been given greater prominence. Right. We saw a very overt examination of that beginning um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, but in a kind of glass ceiling way, it's an unfinished project. Um, so yes, there are many women that have had uh, great success. You will still see substantially fewer solo exhibitions. You will see, n you will not see parity of market value when you get to the very top. 
you can always choose a few counterexamples. But I think it's important to have all kinds of directors across the great range of diversity to champion artwork that speaks broadly about human experience in all of its um, nuances, differences, complexities across the world. So I think it is really important to have women directors. It's, I do think um, you know, one woman director is not going to champion the same thing as another, and there are going to be great directors that are men, but it's about the breadth and range of what is championed and what is emphasized. Is part yeah. of the mission of a university museum to push into the edges that are not necessarily covered and bring a spotlight into those places that are sometimes left uh, dark? I would say yes. And actually, the United States has one of the most vigorous cultures of university art museums. I would trace that back to Dewey, who really formed a lot of the fundamentals of the American education system, obviously library, um, started an emphasis in relationship with China, founder of the China Institute, but he also was passionate about direct experience and the direct experience of art. And so we have created university art museums across our nation um, to a much greater degree than actually Europe, for example, that has a very rich culture of civic museums, city museums. But what we have that is very unique is our university art museum. And it, it is meant to be an intellectually experimental place. It is supposed to champion ideas that may not get emphasized as much in other places. Um, the non-university art museum is often tremendously influenced today by very, very wealthy collectors who like to see the museum echo their own collection. And while there's been, of course, um, great um, support that have come from the wealthy collectors, there are things that get left out. And I think the University Art Museum's part of its role is to reflect that inclination of the university as a whole to push those edges, to, to look at a, a new way of thinking about the past, present, and future, and what may not be told in the standard narrative. Now, you've, you've been um, at the, um, the CU Art Museum for long enough to have um, been able to reshape that institution, and actually in a very physical way. Uh, talk about the genesis of the, of the project that has culminated in the building of this new facility. Well, it's very unique. I mean, there had been long-standing desire for a new building for art and art history and, an, and a better facility for the museum. And previous, previously, what, what did that facility look like? It was a very old World War I era building. We were together. Um, the CU Art Museum, when I came, was called the CU Art Galleries and the Colorado Collection. And so about a year after I came, I led the effort for the name change. I got the support of our dean and then ultimately the regents who voted on the name change. To create one brand and one identity. One brand, one identity, and, and called the CU Art Museum. And we created a new visual identity as well. It's been very effective. People didn't know when they heard CU Art Galleries and then the collection part would be left off. They didn't know if we had a collection. They didn't know if we were a student gallery. They, they just didn't know unless they had been there. The strength we had was immense attendance um, from those that were in the know. But how do you get those that do not know? How do you get them to find a kind of hidden away galleries in a dilapidated old World War I era building? with a quirky name like that. And so the name change was really important. So the name change created the attention, it created the dialogue, because people had questions, you had to answer the questions, and now you start having this interaction between the various community members. Right. There had been a long history of doing very interesting and experimental exhibitions at the CU Art Galleries, even going back to the 80s. It just did not have a sustained profile to the community. And it's a very, very large art department, 900 plus undergraduate majors. So we always had tremendous attendance because of physically being located nearby. But we needed to reach out to that broad and growing art world of the Boulder and Denver metro area. And I also really ramped up our publication presence. Beautiful, very uh, high-end publications 
that of course helped with the branding, helped with the dissemination of the great things we do and, and audience development, but it, it really worked with student government. It's like any government body. They're meeting on a given night and voting. And so having all that concrete representation of what we did, and for example, the diversity of our programming represented physically. So did you, did you engage the students as your advocates? Yes. And again, uh, the campus leadership engaged them um, to help fund a law school, a business school, and a technology building. And the student government came back and said, we will only pass this bill if the visual arts complex, which includes the CU Art Museum and the Department of Art, Art, Art History building, two different buildings, were added to the bill. They had immense pride, I think, from having funded our programs over the years and realized this would serve students of all majors, whereas the law school would really serve just uh, law students. So this is, this is at this point, a quasi-political campaign. Yes. That now is going to support this and help you negotiate. Yes, we went forward as a big team, facilities, leadership, the museum, the Department of Art and Art History, um, to do the program plan, get the state approval, get the Capital Development Committee of the state. These are the legislators that approved mm -hmm. capital development. The state did um, a little, around a third of the project in the end. So you're not only being supported by the campus, but now the museum increasingly is, be, is being seen as a significant asset um, of the of the institution. Absolutely. It's, it's seen as a cultural gateway to the campus, um, a place where the teaching and research mission of the campus comes together with the community. We do major symposia with all our major exhibitions, for example. We typically do them on Saturdays, and we'll have half campus audience and half community audience. And again, we conceptualized all our visitors as learners. So be they student, student learners, staff, faculty, researchers, learners in that sense, or community coming to a university because they want to learn. They want to have their mind opened. You would refer to the fact that half your audience is, is the community. Talk about the, the non-university programs of the museum um, and, and how you approach that interaction with the, the Boulder community, the Colorado community, as opposed to the university. So we have the international, national, and regional arts community, all of which we try to be involved with and contribute to. Um, and regional for us is the state of Colorado, but even more regionally, it would be Denver Boulder. Right. And I have always conceptualized it as one large metropolitan area. Boulder is 30 minutes from Denver, and more and more the whole spheres of the two cities are woven together, increasingly so. And um, so we put ourselves on the map, certainly in Boulder, but also in the broader metro region. We're free to anyone. And that's something I've championed and, and thought a lot about and feel very strongly about for a university art museum. We're a public university, so we right. want to serve the public. And um, there's a big movement now in university art museums to, to get rid of admissions again. Um, I think We've been enormously successful with high-level membership and philanthropic support because of that. So there's an argument that you will actually raise as much money because people want to support that mission. But actually, it was a mission, I think, that was true to the original American philanthropic model, like the founding of the Met, for example. And I think um, we, we want to preserve the intellectual freedom. So that's huge for the community. What comes next? Well, we want to develop a more full um, education program, as I was mentioned. We did build a workshop room into the new facility, and so... For studio arts? It's a smart classroom, so it could be for visual literacy, art appreciation, but also hands-on. So, okay. um, so we're going to look to do that. Um, we would like to build um, the human resource capacity of the museum and eventually need to hire additional curators, help divine, define the curatorial strengths. We overtly defined our mission to be global 
and again, that was to match the global mission of the campus strategic plan. We were already doing that, but then we could make the case to them, we can help facilitate that. We have African art, we have Latin American art, we have European art, we have American art. We are the laboratory learning environment in which classes can engage with a global mindset and right. global education. Well, it sounds like you have a, you have a, a big chunk of work ahead of you, having just completed <laughs> yeah. this, this marvelous uh, new building. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your insights with us. It's my pleasure.